Hello, Humane Marketers. Sarah Znakrocha here. Welcome to another episode of the Humane Marketing Podcast, a place to be for the generation of marketers who cares. This is the show where we talk about marketing your business in a way that feels good to you, is aligned with your values, and also resonates more with your conscious customers because it's not pushy, ethical, and also beautiful. So if you're a regular here, you know that I'm organizing the conversations around the seven P's of humane marketing. And if you're new here and this is your first time, welcome. I'm so excited you're here. You may want to download your one-page marketing plan with the seven P's of humane marketing in the form of a mandala at humane.marketing forward slash one page, the number one and page. So again, humane.marketing forward slash one page. And with that, with no further ado, let's dive into today's conversation. Hey, John, so good to see you, speak to you today. I'm so delighted to have you on the show. Same here, sir. Good to see you. I'm delighted to be invited yeah. onto your podcast show. Oh, well, Great. Like- couldn't have thought of anybody better for today's topic. So here we are talking about passion. And we're actually going to go into a very timely topic as well, like we just discussed offline. But let's start with, you know, the, this idea of passion and, and maybe maybe share first what you are passionate about and how you got into this topic of passion and and yeah kind of employee passion as well because that's really your specialty yeah well as it yes that's right as it relates to kind of employee engagement is kind of a term that most people will understand um or they will have heard the term and and, and here's the rub they think they understand it mm-hmm. maybe not in the in the in the, in the detail that, that can really create an engaged and a passionate workforce because the, the, you know passion covers many you know, you can have a passion for wine, a passion for walking by the lake that you just mentioned, which sounds wonderful on the daily basis, or a passion for hopefully a passion for your work. Because if you're not passionate about what you do, if it's not something that really uh, pops your cork, then you're not going to be as committed. And the organisation, by default, is not going to do as well as it could do if it has an engaged workforce. And and I'll go on and talk about some some stories about businesses I've worked for, because I've kind of worked for a reasonable length of time for about seven or eight businesses, not all based in the UK, some based in the US. And I had the good fortune to work in an engaged engaged businesses and work for disengaged, where where people were not engaged with the work. And the whole atmosphere, the whole culture changes, Mm. depending on on which side of the fence you are. So, So it's kind of being passionate about your work. Now, a lot of folk will say, well, you know, my work's fairly mundane. How do you get passionate about it? Well, that's something that we're going to go on and talk about with there's never been a, a, a more salient time in history than right now for people having those thoughts. Yeah. Why am I doing this job? What, you know, am I going to do this for the rest of my life? Yeah. And so, so it's kind of being passionate. If you're passionate about most things you do, then life's sweeter than, than if, if you are kind of uh, the glass half empty kind so of syndrome. I'm curious, so. John, like for myself, I'm actually, you know, I'm passionate about my work. Mm. But once I had to think outside of work, what I'm passionate about, I kind of felt this feeling of overwhelm, like, because passion is such a strong word. It's it almost is. like there is a bit of pressure on society to be passionate about something. And so I was like, well, you know, I looked at my friend, Valerie, who's passionate about hockey, ice hockey, which is big in Switzerland. Then I looked about you know, at friends who were, you know, big into uh, playing sports or playing music. And I don't have none of those. And so I was like, oh, my God, I, you know, somebody left out the passionate gene in, in, in me. <laughs> and I'm always a bit almost jealous of people who are passionate about the small things you know like football or, or things like that yeah. so 
how do we, you know, find passion? And yes, it, I, I guess it can be in work, but it can also be in, in other things. And how do we not feel left out if, if, you know, currently that's not where we are? Well, it's, a, it's an interesting question. And you just hit on a really interesting point there because you, you said uh, small things like football. Mm-hmm. Now, for some people, yours truly being one of them, who's grown up in, in a culture where football was first, you know, I'm, I'm from Liverpool in the UK, where football is something that's talked about um, pretty much every day in many families, right. because it's a kind of almost, without sounding blasphemous, a religious thing. Right. You kind of, you follow your team through thick and thin and nothing gets in the way and it's a sense of community. Mm-hmm. So I think in looking, I mean, quite often in terms of passion outside of the workplace, it will just come up, all of a sudden somebody will think, do you know, I really enjoy doing that. So my passion outside of, 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 of work is to get on my bike. And I, I'm the great good fortune to live in a, a beautiful part of the English countryside with a few, not too many hills, but a few. So you can get out pretty much any time of the year if the weather's okay and go and have a, a cycle around and come back and feel great about it. Right. So, so what might to other people just seem like going for a cycle for me is a passion. But right. I only just attach that adjective to it. So yeah. I wouldn't get I wouldn't get too hung up on the, oh, everybody else seems to have a passion, but I don't. Because you mentioned about walking down at the lake. You might not think it's a passion, but the way you talked about it, it was, you said, oh, well, it's a beautiful thing to do, and we try and do it every day, and the, the calming effect of water and all the rest of it. So, and I, I happen to know you have a passion for astrology as well. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, for astronomy, rather. Um, so in a way, yeah, I, I think it was Brene Brown or no, uh, Liz Gilbert who said, you know, follow your curiosity that will bring you to your passion. And I always like that a lot because it's it's like if we start with passion, you have to be passionate about something and we get overwhelmed. But if you just follow your curiosity and and yeah, for me, it's astrology and, you know, other things, then yes, I, I, I can. I feel much better about this idea of, you know, this being a passion. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, I think curiosity is a great thing. My wife's business is called Curious About because she writes guides and treasure hunts to UK cities. And she loves just going out and discovering new stuff. That's and com- awesome. coming back and bending my ear about saying, did you know in so-and-so town there's X, Y, Z? Because she loves history as well. So yeah. she might not describe herself as being passionate about it, but believe me, she is. And then she passes that on to the kids and, and they they start asking questions and start getting curious and I think ask, asking questions and understanding the world better is something we all need a lot more of right now yeah yeah so let's get back to kind of the topic du jour which is now being framed as the great resignation mm. so tell us what is going on in the workplace well it kind of it, the story starts with really for me with what is an engaged workplace? What does an engaged workforce look like? And what are the advantages of that? And the advantages are many, starting at the the, the other end, if you like. Engaged workforces, engaged workers stay with you longer. They they work harder. They show more commitment. They take pride in what they do. They're passionate about what they do and the business benefits as a result. Nothing not to like. And it improves people's health and well-being. It's a, a very wide kind of gamut of of benefits. What's happening right now is, first of all, if I use the UK as an example, we're we're a pretty disengaged bunch. This was pre-pandemic. We don't rate well on the global scale of engaged and productive countries. In fact, the UK, if if I was to use a football analogy, the UK is in the relegation zone in terms of its productivity and has been for many, many years now. Since, since basically the end of the Second World War, the UK has lagged behind. And one of the reasons, it, the bankers, the financiers will always come out with all sorts of statistics about the, the mix of the labour force and the productivity of this group against that group and how they measure productivity. But in terms of people jumping out of bed and saying, thank goodness it's Monday, rather than thank goodness it's Friday, we don't, we don't rate well. No. Mm. And what's happening at the moment is kind of lots of a whole chicken coop has come home to roost because the pandemic has been the catalyst for that. Mm -hmm. And I think the 
the word I've heard or the phrase I've heard most that best describes it is that you've almost got this global reset of people have had to do things that they have never in their lifetime. They've had to isolate themselves. They've not had to been allowed to go into their workplace. They've not been allowed to socialize. All kinds of bad stuff has come out of that. But maybe one good thing that's come out of it is that people have sat back and, and had time to think and thought, do I really want to carry on doing what I'm doing? You know, life, it's kind of emphasized life is short. You know, if you're not passionate or if you're not enjoying what you do and believing that it's hopefully creating or contributing to some greater good, why are you doing it? So people are having those thoughts. And I know um, you'll see LinkedIn and, and some of the other platforms who, who kind of got a bit, kind of got a bit of a vested interest in people moving jobs. I've called it, termed it the great resignation. And that is, again, some folk are slightly sceptical saying, is it really that bad? Well, one little story to tell you from, from yesterday, Chris Cooper and myself, we partner with a business called Engagement Multiplier, absolute classic sort of head of the, right ahead of the game in terms of measuring and enabling leaders in businesses to understand how people feel about working in that business, which is the first step that you should take if you're on a journey to improving the culture and, uh, and the en engagement and, uh, and the, the attraction of your business to, to people. And... Um, Chatting to one of the senior guys there yesterday, they've seen such an upsurge in business, not just at the end of the pandemic, because some of the clued up leaders were also taking the time to think at home, thinking, my workforce are not going to be thinking the same when they come back after this. But that's only a small percentage of guys who thought of leaders who thought like that. And so they are thinking, right, how can I take advantage of the situation we're in? Because out of you know, every bad situation that comes opportunity somewhere how can i take advantage of that to um take the workforce on a level and show commitment and engagement to them so engagement multiplier i've seen this incredible upsurge uh, in business and the, the story steve I, I mentioned the great resignation to, to, to this to this guy and he said well we've taken on a relatively new client only 160 People work in the business, so what we would call small, medium enterprise. But they're in the kind of, not quite luxury food market, but they're in a, a niche market for supplying a particular type of, of, of food to, to kind of specialist shops. So out of the 160 people who work for that business in January 2020, currently only 60 of them are left on the payroll. Oh, my God. 100, wow. 100 have decided, do you know what? Now's as good a time as any. Not all because of the pandemic. Some people have retired, all that kind of thing. But what a startling statistic. So the guy who owns that particular business is completely at a loss as, as to what to do. Because, and I've seen this happening in the US as well, just a, a report this morning on slow labor growth in the market there, that although there's all these vacancies, people aren't going to, uh, employers who just think it's the same old, same old, aren't realizing the penny hasn't dropped, that they, they need to sell themselves to their prospective employees. And it's more than just about a flashy advert by uh, and, and, and whatever the salary may be, because that's only a tiny part of the, of the process. So that particular organization uh, have, have kind of had a long, hard look. They've asked the existing or the, the survivors They've asked them, so what are we doing wrong, guys? We, we, we need to be thinking this through. And they've, they've suddenly taken the, you know, the, the cork has come out of the bottle and the genie has come out of the lamp and the genie's escaped and said, these are the things that we need to think about. These are the things that we need. And, and often it takes pretty brave decisions by the people at the top who have to take a long, hard look at themselves and their behaviours. That is, for most organisations, the most difficult part of taking the first step towards creating an engaged workforce. But the great resignation, I mean, that is just one example. Everywhere you go in the UK, that pe the people are particularly, if I use the hospitality trade as, as an example, nobody wants to work there. Mm. Because of, because not because of the wages, because they've they're kind of because of the shortage, one good thing is that these people are now being paid much, much more in line with the, the very hard work that they do, they're being recognized for that. The same with, we've got a huge shortage of lorry drivers, HGV drivers in the UK, causing huge problems across the bit. And, and the, the one good thing that I can see coming out of that is that they're going to get paid a fair day's pay for a fair day's work and they're going to get treated better. Mm -hmm. But it's that being treated better 
that yeah. so many organisations overlook. And, and what does that actually mean? It means it means saying good morning to people, yes, of course, from, from, the, from the top people. But it means so much more than that. So businesses are waking up to this and we're seeing there's, it there's a lot of work ahead for for you and and for you know for companies to really yeah reframe the way they lead reframe they think about culture and yeah. and and you're right it's so much more than just salary because i think that's another thing you know maybe it's related to the pandemic because we really became more aware of priorities and what we mm. all noticed during the pandemic is what really matters is, you know, family, friends, health, those kind of sure. things. Absolutely. It had nothing to do with, with money. Obviously, you need enough money to put food on the table, but it, it's really the values have changed. And so Completely. what do you think really, yeah, like, obviously, maybe some employers are now waking up to that, but it will take also, I guess, some time to you know, regain the trust. So what are the steps that these employers have to take and, and how can you tell them, well, you know, this is not gonna happen overnight. How, how can you work with them and say, but you still have to do it because otherwise, well, your business is dead. Yeah, so, yeah, well, well, they're not gonna keep people, they're not gonna find people and, and the people they do find, they're not gonna stay very long. So, so yeah. you, you're right. And you mentioned a key word then, so trust. Mm -hmm. So. There's been some great research into what makes for an engaged business and what makes for a disengaged business and what the advantages are, which I briefly talked about. And there are statistics I could drown. I just want to talk about one piece of research that kind of was a little bit of a game changer as far as the UK was concerned, because way, way back about just post the, the start of the financial crisis, so 2008, 2009, the UK government commissioned a piece of research because they were so concerned about this productivity gap that I mentioned a little bit earlier about how badly the UK was doing compared to, to, to many other nations. And a very extensive piece of research was done by a guy called David McLeod and his cohort, and, and his uh, co-author, Nita Clark. Uh, and they studied businesses right across the whole spectrum of the UK economy and built on research that had been done in other places, Harvard and, and uh, in, in other great learning institutions. Basically, there are four things that, that were common to all of the engaged and successful businesses. And we've already talked, uh, we've already talked about some of them. The, the, the first, and in no particular order, but there's, there's one most important one in my experience, which I'll come to. Um, in no particular order, what's grandly titled strategic narrative, better known to you and I as purpose, mm. okay? What is this business all about? What are we trying to achieve and how are we gonna get there? Not to be mixed up with vision and mission and all this kind of stuff, because a lot of that stuff is written for the customer. The customer doesn't care about the purpose in 99% of, of cases. It's what, you know, what are we really trying to achieve here? So that you can take a little bit of a, a rain check every now and again. You, oh, hang on, is this actually helping to uh, achieve our purpose? A question that the top team needs to ask themselves and that filters down through the organisation. So having something that people can, a kind of a written statement people can, can hang on to, you go into a lot of businesses and we say, so what's, what, what would your employees say is your purpose? And quite often the top team can't tell you. So you, mm. there's a little, a little clue there for you. Secondly, and for me, a byproduct of this is engaging management. Good, great leadership. People who actually care about the people who work for them. Not in, the, in this sort of pink, this is where you, with, particularly with finance directors, you come up against this, this is all a bit too pink and fluffy for me. It's all about being nice to people. No, it's not. It's treating people with respect. It's stretching them. It's developing them. Uh, it's caring about them as human beings, not just units of production, which goes back to the old Henry Ford way of work way back in the uh, early 20th century. So engaging management, the number one reason people leave an organization, all the research shows is because they, don't, they do not respect or get on with their line management. And that is no matter where the research is done, and it varies between 60 to 80% of the number one reason that people give for leaving. I know from when I've left organizations, it's kind of was, was not comfortable with the way that I was being managed, being directed, being led, being influenced. And so that, that's hugely important. The third one then, employee voice. Sounds simple, but it's kind of, it would be nice to think that what I think actually counts for something around here, or at least someone is listening. The mm. top team are listening. And that's where you need to create a dialogue constant dialogue not just 
the annual sur the annual staff survey is dead in the water. Not just the Absolutely exit interview work. with HR, <laughs> then it's too well, late. Too late. <laughs> still, still important to do those. Yeah. But, but you know, by by getting to the other end and asking people regularly while they're in work, what's working, what isn't, what's hacking you off, what really makes you puts a skip in your step, what can we do differently? All these sort of different these different angles you come at is much better than waiting until somebody a great person has resigned. And then sitting there writing down all the reasons that they would have told you if only you'd asked. So that's that, that, that's so employee voice in all its forms, not just surveys. It's kind of having regular dialogue with people. So what do you think? Yeah. We were thinking of doing this. And purpose is a great one because you can get people involved in that. No matter what the size of the organization, you can say, these are the sort of things that this business is really, this is where we came from. This is where we're going to. We'd like to know what you think. What's going to give you that extra sort of incentive and motivation to, uh, to, to, to you know, go the extra mile for the, for the, for the business. And finally, you, the word that you mentioned, trust, organisational integrity, as it's rather grandly titled. In other words, the top people have to walk the talk. There is absolutely no point in saying, we are a complete, complete meritocracy here, and outside, there's a, in the car park, there's a space for the managing director, a space for the finance director, a space for... So they all get reserved parking spaces. Everybody else has to fight for them. That's, a, that's a, quite a bit of a banal example, but it's kind of, if it's sort of everybody's, you know, first amongst equals type of thing, then every, all the top team have to walk the talk. That is the most difficult thing. When you come to talking to businesses, that's the thing that, 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 that these, that the folk at the top find the most difficult because human nature being what it is, it's so difficult to drop old habits and, and, and reframe them with new ones. And we all know that. We want to give up smoking. We want to lose weight. We want to get healthier. How difficult it is to break some of those habits mm. and get into new ones. So that's changing behaviours in the top team. We, we, we have a, a little uh, reminder for them. We want you to be brave, caring and identifiable, i.e. the book stops with you. You are the top folks. You actually care about the people in your under your control and you're quite happy you're quite willing to take some pretty blunt feedback on the chin and say well nobody's perfect so we'll go out and do something about it yeah so much truth in in all of these four reasons or or, or steps really to more in employee engagement a couple of things yeah. i want to i took some notes first of all i guess the last one trust with leaders mm. uh, we always say people don't leave companies people leave their bosses correct and so that's why this work with the leaders is so important it is no point having these beautiful purpose statements if then they're not you know being... wall hangings in the, in the elevator yeah yeah exactly so so yeah people leave company uh, people leave bosses not their companies yeah, absolutely um, the other thing that kind of dawned on me is is this idea because I think you mentioned Henry Ford and 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 so it's almost like you know it took us that long to really break free from the industrial revolution mm. because if you think about it we still kind of went to work like it was a, a, a factory job yeah. really you know yeah. the typical nine to five job and no brains often and, and just like yeah. execution well let's face it, it is kind of still felt like the uh, industrial revolution and sure. um I often talk to my teenagers like that about the school system as well. Mm. I tell them, look, I, we wish we had a new, a different kind of system. But unfortunately, the way this is, it's still nothing has changed. School was invented when uh, people started to work at factories. And so uh, kids needed to be taken care of. And so we invented schools and, you know, we put all our kids to, kids to schools. And unfortunately, nothing has changed. The school is still taught the same way. And we're just freeing up the parents so they can go be good worker bees at the, you know, factories or whatever jobs they have. Sure. And so that we, we are, John, and uh, you and I are in, in this business elevation mm. kind of mastermind or group, and we're talking about the fourth turning. So this book that really talks about this new kind of era that we're hopefully stepping into after. So there's the, the idea is that the, the history is cyclical. And after, mm -hmm. you know, four cycles, hopefully we'll start with a new one. And so I really get this feeling that, this is what we need to break free from is 
the industrial revolution so that we can sure. end this cycle and enter into a new one. Yeah, I'd yeah. love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, you mentioned it. A key element of that is, I mentioned about employee voice, and it is incredible. And, and I have always, I'm always saying I'm not going to be surprised by what people say and by what people come up with, but I am, regardless. And I read the results of all the clients that we take on board uh, start to do regular surveys with their staff. So typically every three months. And after the initial people sort of folding their arms metaphorically and saying, Ooh, well, I'm not, bit, not, not too sure about this. If I speak up, am I, am I going to get fired for, for, for speaking up? Once all that's been put to bed by building that trust that we talked about, people come out with the most incredible creative ideas to kind of maybe help boost revenue or, or reduce waste. And, and the sustainability piece comes in. So the kind of, that's lots of ticks in the boxes. Mm. Well, that creativity is largely knocked out of us at school. Mm. And so any educationist, any parent should watch the most watched TED talk of all time by Sir Ken Robinson, which I always use as my, whenever I'm talking to educationists, I say, watch this great 19 and a half minutes talk. As I say, I think it's 100 million people who watch this thing. We'll, we'll make um, sure to link to it in the show notes. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. About, and it's simply entitled Why Schools Kill Creativity from one of the greatest educationalists that has ever lived. Bless, God rest his soul, he passed away last year, Sir Ken, but I had a lot of time for him. I've read his books on finding your elements where your passion for doing something crosses over with your competence at doing it. Wow, eureka moment. You, you find, you know, and, and we talked about finding those sort of things out of the work, out of the work environment as well. Mm -hmm. So that, that, yeah, to move on from that units of production where people almost died at their desks or died on the factory floor, just being literally you know, worked to death was the expression where, where all the owners of the, uh, of the factories cared about was profit, didn't give it, you know, anything to the people. Those, those days you would hope are gone, but they still exist in little pockets. And they still exist in terms of people doing office jobs from organisations that don't really demonstrate that they care very much about the workforce. And those chickens have well and truly come home to roost, as a, you know, just accelerated by the pandemic, really. How do you see the next... 10 years evolve we would hope there's you know kind of the this leap in awareness and change but we still have to be also realistic that it's probably going to take some time for these companies and leaders to to change how fast do you see things changing well i, I think the, i think the pace of change will pick up i think this current the great resignation and the things that we've already talked about all of a sudden in boardrooms it's not looking at sales charts and revenue charts it's looking at employee attrition rates and turnover. Mm -hmm. And so many businesses do not understand. I have some very simple calculations that I always direct at the finance director. So that, because that's the way to the finance director's heart is through the, through the, the hole it's putting in their, in their revenue and adding to their costs. So many businesses completely underestimate how much it costs to replace. And, and so I think the pace of change will accelerate. I think the huge threat stroke opportunity that's coming faster than people think is artificial intelligence. So that will take over reams of jobs. Where are those people going to be employed in the future? Hopefully in much more creative type roles. There's a, there's a you know, we need to go green for, for more reasons than, you know, just producing uh, carbon free, uh, carb, you know, reducing carbon emissions and, and saving the planet. It's the, it's, it's the only way forward whereby you're going to create a completely new industry or which is already in full swing, as we know, because, because on our last call with, with Chris and, and the group, we talked about the great energy revolution that's going on. So, so there are going to be new opportunities there. Hopefully, as, as one old industry dies, the coal, the fossil fuel industry, the green revolution takes place and, and people go and retrain and go into those jobs. But artificial intelligence is going to play a huge part in that. So the, the, there's going to be a scarcity of skilled labour is going to continue with, with more employers chasing fewer and fewer people. Because I, and I also think people will, given the opportunity, will, will retire from full-time work and there'll be a big move to, to part-time work mm -hmm. so that people can get that, try and achieve that elusive work-life balance that gets talked about an awful lot. Mm -hmm. um, so huge changes are going to go on. But I, I do think on the engagement side, we are going to see a very steep lift off and, and i'll give you an example i, I used to work in the theater 
down in, in, in Leston, quite near uh, where I live. I spent a brief time working in the performing arts, which was, which was great fun. There's another very big, famous theatre in, in the UK that's just advertised for a people and engagement executive. Now, I've never seen that in the... As a title, yeah, I love that. Exactly. And then I read the job, I thought, oh, I should apply for this job. <laughs> um, but then I read what, what's been put in it, and it's, it's kind of, that's an industry where it's a tough, tough business being on the stage and being, it's not highly paid for the vast majority of, of performers. It, it's tough, it's long hours, it's antisocial hours, it's a lot of time away from your family and, and from your home. And the people who work to support, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty low wage economy. People do it because they're passionate about it. But to see that that, that industry is starting to wake up, because this is quite a big influential theatre, this will, this will send ripples around. Others will be thinking, well, do we need to be doing something like that as well? So to see it starting in that industry in the UK, is, and that was just yesterday that I saw that particular ad, just emphasises to me that, that the, the, the evolution is becoming a revolution. The pace is picking up now. People are saying, well, my business is, is not going to survive unless I'm a very attractive place to come and work. Yeah. And I make people feel like, wow, where have you been all my life? I mean, the, my kids' generation, by the way, sir, they've been doing this for a few years. They, you know, I've got one who works for the BBC, one who works for a climate change business, and one who's a teacher. They all, they're all following the passion. Oh, yeah. I wish I could have done that at that age, but that generation have got a different view on it. Yeah. So unless you, unless you as an organisation sell yourself to them, they're going to say, nah, I'm not interested in how much money you're making or how much you're going to pay me. I'm more interested in, 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 the, in the bigger picture, in, in, in what I'm doing to, to help save the world or whatever it may be. So yeah. I love I love this I love love this look you know it's like we're heading in the right direction it will be probably a, a rough journey in the next uh, maybe two to three years it'll be like shaking up everything right yeah. but it's so it's so needed so yeah I, I can't wait and I can't wait also for this idea of like you said giving people. Uh, the option much more to work part-time as well so that they don't burn out and we're in the middle of sort of a mental health crisis and so all Absolutely. of these things they play together so it's it's really yeah. just time well, for the change. organizations who are insisting that people come back and work five days a week in the office guess what's happening people are leaving yeah They've actually they found a bit of balance and productivity in the uk uh, i haven't seen the, the figures across the the whole planet because because it, it gets measured quite differently in different places productivity during the pandemic has gone up nice. because because you know one of my neighbors who has to travel into into nottingham has saved himself two hours a day yeah. okay he's been able to spend half an hour extra with his half an hour nice and productive he's a morning person nice and productive doing stuff and his business has done better as a, as a result so the organizations that are saying oh you've got we've got to be rigid about this if flexibility is key yeah, to this true. Uh, and, and it's organizations who are not listening to their staff or they're not asking them yeah more likely all amounts to the same thing yeah so good what one thing i did also write down that i need to challenge you uh on it is is kind of from the marketing point of view is it, you just kind of quickly said yeah clients 99 percent of the time they don't care about purpose mm -hmm. and i'd like you to maybe also think about how this is going to change in the very, very near future. And all, in my opinion, it already has changed because clients, and that, that means customers and, you know, our clients, your clients, even the person who's going to buy a new, I don't know, uh, vacuum, you know, people are going to care about the purpose behind the company. Probably not yeah. so much if you buy a burger, you know, or a, a loaf of bread, but for the bigger things, people are going to want to follow companies and, and brands who, who stand for something, who have the same, we talk a lot about the worldview here on Humane Marketing, who have the same worldview, who have the same values. So yeah. I think that's something that can also become a, you know, a point of interest for organizations. It's not just to attract employees, it's also to attract customers because the, the, all the, you know, the big CO2 emissions companies, well, eventually people are not going to want to buy from them anymore. Sure, so. sure. And, and, and you're absolutely right. That, that kind of throwaway line is really the view that customers have of a, of a, a business's purpose 
a lot of times doesn't even come into their thought process when they're buying. Uh, but for some bigger, more long-term, more life-changing decisions. I mean, we talked just the other day on our call about where you maybe ask your financial advisor or where if you do it yourself, where you invest so that you invest maybe in sustainable and green stuff and you get rid of it. So, so that does matter right. uh, in, in terms of purpose. But, but the point is the customer doesn't really need to know the detail of that. Purpose is really written for the uh, for, for the employees of the company so they so they can all get behind one this is this is what we are all about but, but definitely the, the consumerism the power of consumers in, in, in terms of saying well I don't want if we use it again and use investments as a as an example I do not want to be investing in oil and coal companies I'd like to be investing in offshore wind farms or solar panels or whatever it may be that that movement's already picking up pace yeah. hugely I mean the, the statistics are quite incredible. Yeah. That. Um, and and in, in terms of the purpose as well, it, it's one of our big four consultancy businesses in the UK, Ernst, formerly known as Ernst and Young, they're now EY. I don't, probably, it probably means that the, the boards are cheaper to make because uh, they don't have as many letters on. They did some great research about uh, four or five years ago showing that companies with uh, a purpose that was understood and accepted and bought into by the, the workforce were 85% more successful than companies that didn't have a purpose. Uh, so... It's by any measure as well, not just by revenue measure, but just by what, what their public uh, perception of the company was. So, yes, big changes coming around as well. Yeah, we can't wait, really. Yeah. <laughs> hurry, really hurry up, hurry up, John, really to work with all these companies. <laughs> so, yeah, tell us how, where people can find out more about you and, and how they can work with you. Well, they can go to chriscooper.co.uk, my, my esteemed business partner, Mr. Cooper. That's his website, which has all our all our stuff on my I, i'm pretty easy to find on linkedin i can i can provide you with the the, the url for that so no problem at all and the email address is on chris's website it's just a nice easy one john at chriscooper.co.uk um no so always delighted to talk to people always delighted to make uh, contacts on uh, via an easy medium like linkedin so yeah always happy to have conversations with people that's wonderful. I always have one last question that I ask all my guests, and that's, what are you grateful for today or this week, John? Well, this week, on a personal note, my baby grandson, who's 11 months old, he was poorly last week, so we had to drop everything and go and help out his parents because they're both teachers and they couldn't take time out to, well, it's almost impossible for them to take time out. So we went and looked after him for a few days. Now he's back to his bubbling, smiley best. <laughs> So, and it's amazing if you have a little Zoom call with him or you see his mum sends you a little video during the day, just how that sort of make, perks you up. Because, um, <laughs> uh, you know, when, when babies laugh, you know, I think the world laughs with them. And so, yes, absolutely delighted about that. And reasons for optimism, what am I grateful for this week? I saw some news about the big COP26 summit coming up in the UK in Glasgow, up in Scotland. Uh, There's always um, <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm, I've just seen some, some positive news though about things that are you know we see so much negative stuff because mm. for whatever reason bad news always travels faster than good i've seen good news about that about the about the intentions about how people are going to get serious about it. and also for the uh, as far as the collective is concerned i i mentioned about my my middle eldest daughter's partner going to work in the u.s soon on a huge wind farm project off the off the northeast coast of the u.s and, and i kind of circulated that amongst the group and i actually read up on some of it and thought wow this is this is world changing stuff so, you know, I sent James, you know, my best wishes on, 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 for, for all that and said, uh, if there's anything the collective can do to, to help or, you know, we're, we're going to be over in, in Rhode Island and Massachusetts supporting them once they've moved over there. So, again, that was a reason to be cheerful. So, Lot, quite a few of family-based. Yeah, lots of things to be proud of and grateful for, yeah. right? Awesome. Absolutely grateful for. Yeah. yeah, wonderful. And I love the fact that you mentioned children. I, I really think also I had that conversation with someone last week that going forward, we need to make sure that we, you know, really have this uh, way of living where we have different generations in one mm. place. Because I feel like the pandemic has also shown us so much loneliness, loneliness and, you know, especially for old people. So mixing communities up with young and, and old and all 
like we can learn so much from the children but we can also learn from the elders so absolutely just kind of learning to uh, live more together again i think that's key going forward as well oh absolutely for sense of community and passing the you know once you get to the elder stage which i'm, I'm i think i'm nearly at <laughs> you, you can pass on you know if you asked for it because yeah. teenagers for example don't usually ask you have to tell them no and, and then they don't listen. But, but all of a sudden all of a yeah. sudden they get to that age around i don't know 24 25 yeah. when they start asking you advice and saying yeah. what would you do about so so being able to, to hopefully pass on uh wisdom that you've learned from your parents uh, and as you say you need you need people in the community to do that so yeah that's, yeah. that's certainly something to, uh, to work at it's been great to talk to you john thank you so much for coming on yeah fully enjoyed it sarah thank, thank you. you very much for inviting me Thanks so much for watching and being part of a generation of marketers who cares for yourself, for your clients, and for the planet. We really are change makers before we are marketers. So go ahead, be the change you want to see in the world. And I hope to see you again next week. Take care.